Hello, and welcome to another episode of In the Studio. I'm your host today, Alex Silva, and I'm here with Chi Smith, who is the author of her memoir, Tiger Lily, about her experiences leaving Vietnam and uh, coming to the United States and uh, living here and growing up here. And uh, now she's here with us to tell us all about her experience. Um, well, welcome to the show. Thank you, Alex. So just a quick, um, it's oh, tiger fish. fish. I'm sorry. <laughs> I knew it's, I would mess up somehow. Uh, that's OK. So, that's all right. Sorry um, about that. No, that's OK. Um, um, it's uh, a pleasure to be here. I get nervous. Here. <laughs> it's, okay. it's all right. It's all good. Um, so you left Vietnam in mm -hmm. 1975. This is the end of the Vietnamese War. and. What uh, you were telling me, you left Da Nang as a right. child? So just to give you context of um, what the book is about, I, we left Da Nang uh, March 28th of 1975. And it took us five weeks to leave Da Nang to get all the way down to Saigon, where we flew out um, under the protection of uh, the embassy, US Embassy. And that was April 25th which is mm -hmm. five days before the fall of Saigon. And then we landed in Guam um, mm -hmm. first. And then from Guam, um, it took about a week to do the immigration, uh, immunization and all that. And then uh, we were flown to San Diego and Camp Pendleton. We were the first wave to Guam uh, mm -hmm. at the Air Force Base, their Amazon Air Force Base. And then we were the first wave to Camp Pendleton when they were just pitching up the tents and mm -hmm. uh, getting things ready for the refugees, um, thousands incoming refugees. So that's a quick timeline. Okay. Yeah. And so after a few months, eventually you wound up in Fresno, California. Right. And this is where you then became an American and started right. learning how to uh, acclimatize and acculturize to American mm -hmm. culture. Right. So. Why, like, what was difficult about that? I mean, obviously, you cover, this is a big portion of the, right. the book, Growing Up in America, Culture Shock. and So um, just start from the beginning. You know, I was 13. So I was coming of age and having to um, straddle between two cultures. At home, my family is very traditional Vietnamese. My dad. Obviously, he was the colonel, so he was very regimented, very disciplined. He had been a soldier. In He's, the, yes, the and he army. was, he had, his life was always been a soldier. And when we left, he was the colonel of the South Vietnamese Army. So um, our family brought us up to be very um, disciplined and traditional. So having to navigate and retain our Vietnamese-ness uh, not only in the family, but in the community, in the Vietnamese community, albeit there's only a handful of Vietnamese families back then in Fresno. Um, so we have to make sure that we followed the traditions in the family and then within the Vietnamese community. And then, so that's the Vietnamese side. And then, of course, when I went to school, I have to make sure that I can fit in being a 13-year-old. Everyone. I would think that wants to not stand out. And right. so I have to make sure that what was it okay to do as a, um, as a student? How do I treat my, my peers? How do I make friends? How do I treat my teachers? Because these rules have been changed and it's not the same. So it's a lot of, you know, I would say earlier I talked to about code switching. I was doing that before I knew what the what there was, was such it, a, right. a phenomenon. So switching between two cultures and making sure that I behave within those parameters, so that mm -hmm. you know the Vietnamese communities wouldn't say that we're too Americanized, that we're losing our roots, and make sure that we're respectful to our parents. And then when right. we were at school, you know, I internalized a lot of uh, the racism and the hatred and the bullying. Um, from the kids uh, right. who I went to school with, and it just, you know, basically just kind of internalize it and not deal with it head on. Most of, you know, most people, and there's a, so having, you know, learned the language, and I remember looking up many words. I mean, probably most words. I would sit down with my chemistry, you know, uh, 
lessons or, or biology, and I looked up a whole bunch of words. So we were extra hard. We meaning, you know, my family mm -hmm. having to go into new school, and we worked hard to just just to fit in and 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 to advance in our education, and we suppress a lot of things. Like we didn't deal with our grief. We just right. dropped here in America. We're so grateful. You had to leave people behind when you left. Right? Yeah, and so. our identity, uh, social, you know, cultural, all of our identity, what made who we were before we left. Now it's it's a, this is a new life. So I had survivor guilt. So I couldn't. I was so grateful to be here that I didn't have time to say, you know, this is so bad that this and that. No, we were very grateful to be here. Mm -hmm. So there's that. Um, so acculturation is difficult, but then there's other layers, um, you know, having to, how do we deal with it in a way, how did I deal in a way that I was okay and be accepted by my peers at school and right. and be accepted by my parents? And, and uh, at that time, the word refugee was something I didn't want to have anything to do with. I just right. You just wanted aside. to fit in and be an American yeah. just like, everyone else. Right, right. Um, so I know you talk in the book a lot about it, but different observations. It's very clear in reading the book that you were very observant about human behavior, both when you were in Vietnam and here in the States and the different mm -hmm. ways the other students would behave and the way people mm -hmm. dressed and spoke. Um, you noticed that uh, the students at your first school weren't taking their education very seriously, and that was something yeah. that was a, sort of a shock for you because you always were very studious, and then, of course, your family emphasized education, and then as you moved up, you got to a better school. Right. But it was still difficult, right? Right. Fitting so, um, really, I wanted to um, share my observations in that even though at first blush, it seemed like we as there's different races and different ethnic groups, and we look different, we eat different food, we sound differently. Um, really, when you peel all of the superficial layers out, we share a lot of the same human experience, the, the universal human experience. By that, I mean, you know. The coming of age experience is the same with you and I. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, my husband and I, we lived separate lives but parallel lives because he lived in America and I live in Vietnam. We watched the same US TV shows that the GIs brought over. We listened to the same music. The difference, the only difference is that he understood what was going on and I didn't. <laughs> but you know, we, we now talk about and reminisce about the TV shows and the music. So, but besides that, you know, honestly, we, we come of age having the same angst, having the same concern. So um, I want to point out and appeal to my readers that uh, we all share more commonalities and attributes, um, just the universal human experience like I talked about, than there are differences. And now more than ever, I, I, I want to appeal to people in general and my, and my readers that, you know, um, hatred and racism hurt more than it helps. I mean, it right. never helps. And there's mis there's a lot of um, uh, misidentity of people, and they think, oh, they don't look the same, or they don't sound the same, so we have this tendency towards them with to hatred. To focus on those differences. Yeah, but actually, than... you know, I have a friend who was born in America, and she moved around with her father because her father, you know, moved around a lot, and so she has a Brazilian accent. So they hated on her, thinking that she's not from here, and told her to go back to where, but she was she born was in America. America. So there's a lot of misidentity, mm -hmm. and so I just want to appeal to folks, you know, just take a breather. <laughs> you know, we're mm -hmm. all pretty much, you know, we all mm -hmm. have family we love, um, and as refugees and immigrants. We, we took a lot of jobs that nobody wanted. We're not here. We and weren't you were all here. worked very hard. Your brothers and sisters all yeah. had full-time jobs to help support the family. Yeah, so my father was a colonel, and he, when he came to America, uh, the church we sponsored us offered him a job um, as a janitor. So he went from being a colonel to being a, a janitor, but we were so blissfully happy because we had our lives. We had each other. And uh, we knew that it was a temporary situation. We knew that with education, we would advance. Um, mm -hmm. And we want to uh, contribute 
to society. And I think with immigrants and refugees, from you know, from my understanding, we work very hard because we have this loyalty to our new home country. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you said you started the book as a personal project for your family in 1992, correct. actually. Right. Even though it was only published this year. So, Can correct. Can talk a little bit about yeah, the gestation absolutely. of the book? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, my husband and I moved to Clarksburg in 1992 for a new job. Mm -hmm. um, Clarksburg, California? Yeah, right? Clarksburg, California. Yeah. My daughter was two. And at the time, I thought um, it would be a good time because I'm looking at the new generation, I thought my kids ought to know where I came from. They ought to know their heritage. They ought to know what it was like for Chi uh, in a day in a life, a Chi's life back home, and how how did we, or our family, came to America. So I start writing it, and it was done about five years, but it sat on my computer because it was it's a deeply personal story. So it was only meant for our family and the future generations. But then. You know, so it sat there, and then in 2011, um, starting with the Syrian refugee crisis, it started to bubble up. All these feelings of my feeling like this is my moral obligation. Now that I made it in safely, it's not okay, in my opinion, to just turn my back and say I got in safe. Too bad, so sad for you. I, f I feel that compelling reason to share my story. And so I started to work on it and edit it and doing all of the... Um, all the different process for publishing, and but it just gotten really to the crescendo of it all is the beginning of this year when the first executive order came out, and that was unequivocally my reason that I'm going to publish and I'm going to publish on the deadline that I set for myself. So I did it not originally; it was only for my family, but then I publish it for the world because. Even though it's a deeply personal story, deserve it deserves. Um, it is now no longer my story. It, it it needs to be shared to the community, and I urge others, um, you know, refugees and immigrants, to share their stories because, as hard as it was for me, it's just really a drop in the bucket. I didn't suffer like a lot of other people have suffered, and I know there's millions of stories out there that need to be told because that should be our national archives. That should be our oral history because history books. Let's face it, they don't really right. reflect different angles and different perspectives of all the immigrants and all the refugees that came to America. So I hope that, um, you know, and I talk to um, high school students as well, mm -hmm. um, and I encourage them to, to, to write their story, to write the parents' stories, because um, the world needs to know. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, um, it's a deeply personal, but we deserve, America deserve to hear these unique stories because then... All the stories that make up our... Yeah, and that would promote more understanding. Mm -hmm. um, I think the insecurity and all the hatred might be coming from not knowing the other side. If you start to dialogue and just listen, not actively listening, then we'll be good. And that's, that's the reason, one of the reasons, yeah. Well, I definitely, I read the book and... Uh, I definitely reflected a lot. It made me think. It was a, a very easy read, and uh, it had all sorts of positive emotions, sadness, everything. I thought it was uh, it was great, and uh, I'm glad you could come and talk to us about it. Um, where can people go to find out more about the book and your various appearances? You know, I know um, you're promoting. Uh, so um, um, here in Davis, you mm -hmm. can go to the Avid Reader. They carry my book. Right. Um, I love to support the indie bookstore. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you have a website? I have a website. It's yeah. uh, www.chibeingchi.com. That's C-H-I being chi. Yeah, C-H-I being C-H-I.com. And um, it's actually also inside the book, it, you know, where it says, um, you know, if you find errors, write me. So it's, <laughs> it's also in here. So if you wanted to write there. But I also have it on Amazon um, because... Um, that's the big one. <laughs> That's the big one. But I also have it, it at other um, okay. bookstores like Avid Reader in uh, Sacramento and mm. various other ones. Um, and are you planning to follow a sequel? Because I know there's more <laughs> to the story. So <laughs> what I can say is I am working on a book. Okay. Yeah. And it would be to uh, 
compliment or supplement Tiger Fish, it is in response to my readers and um, how they've reacted. Yeah, to Yeah, I have a lot of readers that wanted to know more, and so. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on thank the show. Thank you so much, Alex. That wraps up another episode of In the Studio, and thanks for joining us. We'll see you in the future. <laughs>